On this week's episode, Kyle Larson kisses some bricks, Lando Norris has a workplace dispute, and Santino Ferrucci learned he is in fact not a bald eagle. Welcome back to the Break Hard Show. My name is Matt. Yes, we are back from a two-week hiatus. Didn't take as long as The Sopranos took off, but I did take two weeks off because I got back from Chicago street course, didn't have time to record it. Pocono week after that race, had a busy week, didn't have time again. But we are back to talk about the Brickyard 400, as well as what happened in Formula One out at the Hungarian Grand Prix, as well as what happened up in Toronto with the IndyCar Series. I was on grounds, well, both on Friday night for the Truck Series race at IRP, as well as Sunday's NASCAR Cup Series race at the Brickyard 400. Let's start there because, of course, that is the biggest talking point of the weekend, at least in North American motorsports. And Kyle Larson comes out victorious. He picks up his third win in a NASCAR Crown Jewel event, his first win at the Indianapolis Motor Speedway, his first Brickyard 400, his the 11th Brickyard 400 win for Hendrick Motorsports, which is a massive accomplishment for them. And now Hendrick Motorsports has won the Brickyard 400, the inaugural one in 1994. They won in 2004 with Jeff Gordon, 2014 with Jeff Gordon, and now they've won in 2024 with Kyle Larson, who I think Jeff Gordon continues to live vicariously through. And it's actually kind of really wholesome to watch. And also another wholesome one before we get into what happens with the race, Rick Hendrick on pit road after the race, taking a picture of the scoring pylon with Kyle Larson's, you know, picture on it just with his iPhone is just like the most wholesome, like grandfather type of content that you can get. And I know there's people that don't like Hendrick Motorsports, you know, and whatever else goes into that. But it is kind of cool how supportive he is of his drivers and how much I think he appreciates everything that they do for him and that company. Just kind of one of those nice wholesome moments. But let's get into the actual race, the crossroads of America, Indiana, unless of course, you're trying to get to 74 on 465. In which case, Indianapolis said, hey, you know, good luck with that one there pal why don't you take this sam jones parkway or whatever the name of it was disastrous on friday disastrous on sunday really not that bad it's just the fact that it took forever but we're back brickyard 400 we're talking about nobody can pass fans are not in the grandstands big talking point as well and is this a crown jewel so you absolutely know brickyard 400 is back baby let's get right into it with what happened on track the start of the race tyler reddick absolutely fired off and he was gone and it looked like it was going to be one of those days where nobody was going to be able to pass and it kind of was that to an extent he ends up pitting that you know eventually hands the lead to Denny Hamlin. He goes on to win stage one of the of the Brickyard 400. And Denny Hamlin and Chris Gabehart coming into this weekend. Chris Gabehart said that they prepared for this race at a championship race level. They prepared for this the same way they would prepare for that championship race at Phoenix. Which of course, if you're a NASCAR fan and you're familiar with what Chris Gabehart and Denny Hamlin do, what their game is, they absolutely collapsed and did not win this race. So spoiler alert there. After I already said that Larson won, but yeah, the 11 car. Here's what happened. Did they over prepare? Think Things like this happen on Sunday. What happened for them? They didn't have the fastest car um, on Sunday. At all. Well, not at all, but definitely not a race winning fast car. They got themselves back in traffic with their pit strategy, and then they end up wadded up in a crash, which we'll get to. So stage one goes to Denny Hamlin, and that was about the best his day was going to get there. And then in the start of stage two, well, during stage two, rather, Cody Ware reminded us and, well, the state of North Carolina that he was actually in this race when a caution came out for the carcass of his tire that had fallen off. That then set up a restart when some chaos absolutely ensued from that. On the restart, out of turn two, Ryan Priest, driven sunglasses athlete, use code BREAKHARD at checkout for 20% off as well as free shipping. Shame Let's plug right there. He tries to go three wide in the middle between William Byron, Ryan Priest, Harrison Byrne. Harrison, I don't think, realized that he was going three wide, tries to close that gap, turns himself into the 24 car, puts the 24 into the outside wall, sends the 24 back across to the inside wall. When he's going back across, he collects a 16 of AJ Allmendinger, lifts AJ's wheels off the ground like he's about to go ramp Dukes of Hazard style. Thankfully, it came back down and didn't have anything worse happen to him there. And then Byron pounds the inside wall. His day was done. And honestly, it felt like this day could have set up pretty well for William Byron. Like I would mentioned before, Hendrick Motorsports wins basically every 10 years in this race. It feels like the 24 car won in 94, the 24 car won in 2004, 24 car won in 2014. And it felt like the 24 car needed to win again in 2024 just to continue the trend along there. Ultimately, his day was done. And Byron probably desperately really needs this two week break because that team has just been not on top of things as of late and, and now finds themselves a race behind Kyle Larson in terms of total wins this season. And hopefully after, for their sake, at least after the 
summer break here that we have for the Olympics, they can regain some of that momentum that they had at the beginning of the season. Also in stage two, I think it's worth noting that John Hunter Niemicek and Legacy Motor Club brought speed and not just some speed. I mean, driving away from the field speed. Now, granted, clean air was the absolute king on Sunday, but John Hunter Niemicek, when he got out front, he kind of checked out right there. He had as much, he had so much speed that I think if he had won the race, NASCAR is like, wait a second, what is going on here? Like they would have had a double look the same way that like when a baseball player has a really big game, he immediately gets hit for a PE test right after the game same thing happening here like where did this performance come from and now that legacy motor club team has brought speed uh basically what i think john hunter said three out of the last five races they've had really good speed and he's not wrong it feels a lot like last year when legacy was bad in the first half of the year and then they got rid of Noah gragson and seemingly picked up speed through the second half of the year and that seems to be what they've started to do here as well maybe they're finally getting their footing underneath themselves with this switch to to trd in that second stage uh, not much else happened other than Bubba Wallace went on to win stage number two there. He uh, gave Booty Barker pretty good, you know, strategy options to play with right here. And for Bubba, this was a massive stage win for him. Not only is it a playoff point and 10 extra points for the day, but it also helps him continue to eat away at that lead that Ross Chastain had in the last spot in the NASCAR Cup Series playoffs. He's got it all the way down to seven points now, which seemed, you know, unfathomable just a couple weeks ago that he'd be able to point his way this much better than what Ross Chastain has been able to do. But for Bubba, it's a major step towards getting himself back into the championship, into the playoffs on points for now. And unless he, of course, can win at Michigan or Richmond or Daytona or even Darlington for that matter. So there's some options out there for Bubba still. And, you know, pointing his way in while people didn't think it was on the table a couple weeks ago, very, very much on the table for him. So he wins stage number two. In stage number three, things once again got chaotic here. On the ensuing restart, you have Ross Chastain move the 19 car of Martin Truex Jr. out of the way in turn one, and then going down into turn three, he and Larson are side by side. Larson and he make contact. The 19 goes into the wall. The 54 and the four end up tangling. Josh Berry actually gets the most damage out of this whole incident. He smashes the turn four wall, like entry to turn four right there, just destroys Caitlin Clark on the front of his car, the same way I'm sure Angel Reese probably wishes that she could. His day was done. Driven sunglasses glasses athlete as well like i said break card 20 percent off at checkout and you get free shipping as well great sunglasses so you move on from that incident and then on another restart and then on the ensuing restart you have Noah gregs and carson hosver trying to go three wide gregson runs in the back of the 12 car he ends up turning into jimmy johnson who then collects joey logano both of those guys have hard hits to the outside wall for jimmy his day was done I uh, just, I mean, I know people are saying hang it up for Jimmy Johnson. Jimmy Johnson can do whatever he wants to do in my mind, but just absolutely brutal two-year experimental return for him, especially here at Indianapolis. Again, obviously, I think he wanted to run this race because he didn't get to in his final season when he contracted COVID. And Justin Allgaier had to run that race for him in the 48 car, and now he has that big, big incident as well. Joey Logano, I was standing on pit road when he got wrecked. Crowd went crazy when they showed his wrecked race car on the video boards, and then into Typical, sensible fan fashion. He gets out of the car and everybody applauded. They're happy to see that he's okay. Glad he wrecked out, but happy to see that he's okay. Never want to see anybody get injured. This whole race had a lot of great strategy. Maybe didn't have the best on-track passing, but it had really, really interesting strategy. So you had multiple different fuel strategies playing out. Guys trying to just eliminate an entire pit stop by running long, saving fuel, doing everything that they possibly could. And it looked like it might all play out, you know, to see how some of those interesting things could work out. In that final stage, Martin Truex Jr. wrecks again. And then we have an incident leading up to the end of the race, which ends up setting up a green-white checker, which was really unfortunate because we had Brad Keselowski, who was trying to basically go over 50 laps on a tank of fuel like 59 laps i believe is what it actually would have came out to be 58 laps somewhere in there on a tank of fuel that was just seemingly never going to work and then it almost did end up working for him or at least we thought it might almost win for him ultimately did not end up working but he was leading you had ryan blaney in second and kyle larson who uh with 37 laps to go Cliff Daniels pits him and is like, hey, I'm going to give you all the fuel that you need to get to the end. Fresh tires, your P23, drive your butt back to the front. And that's exactly what Kyle Larson did. If you go to Twitter, uh, break hard, I retweeted, apologies for the name, I'm not sure who it was, uh, posted a video of all of Kyle Larson's passes, or at least most of them, in that final stint that he had. And he was just putting moves on guys left and right. Yes, people were saving fuel, so it made his passes a little bit easier. But he seemingly learned a lot from his Indy 500 outing, and he was putting moves on guys that felt a lot like an IndyCar race. He got Tyler Reddick 
bait and switched him. His pass on Christopher Bell was super sketchy, managed to drive out the other side of that one, set Denny Hamlin up perfectly in the short shoot. Just really, really impressive driving by Kyle Larson to get back to the front. And in those closing laps, we had Brad Kozlowski. Would he run out of gas? Ryan Blaney, could he pass the six car? Is he going to have enough fuel to make it to the end? And then you have Kyle Larson, who catches them, and then seemingly maybe couldn't get around him, but we weren't sure how all that was going to play out. And it was about to be an all-time finish, maybe, until Denny Hamlin and Kyle Busch run into each other. Kyle Busch, on pace to have a top 10 run, once again, does not get a top 10 finish out of this and said he has a wrecked race car. They bring out the caution, which sets up an overtime restart. So then we go into overtime. We have this restart. And as we're coming to the green flag, the pace car pulls off and Brad Keselowski follows the pace car down pit lane because he's now out of fuel, which that means that Kyle Larson then moves up and inherits that front row spot. Ryan Blaney is technically the leader on the outside. And then you have the green flag come out and it seems like Kyle Larson fires first. When you listen to the onboard camera uh, from both of these cars, if Kyle Larson fires first, it's by a quarter of a second. I do think that he hits the throttle first, but I don't think it's as egregious as maybe it looked on TV. They go off into turn two. Then there's another accident, a big accident back in turn one. John Hunter Nemechek and others went absolutely plowing into the inside wall. And then the outside wall moved the barrier on the inside wall at the exit of pit road as they had a red flag of the race and fixed that, fixed the outside wall. Just a whole big chaos there. Ryan Blaney over the radio incensed. He's saying the F word so many times. I don't think NBC could have bleeped it all if they wanted to. He called Kyle Larson NASCAR's golden boy, said they should have waved off the restart, everything under the sun. But NASCAR, you know, uh, vice president of competition, Elton Sawyer, talked about this post-race, which, interestingly enough, the only media that he talked to was NASCAR.com. So that is a little questionable, but whatever. He answered the question, and he said that we, he said, even if we did wave off the restart, he's like, we're not going to choose again. That's how the rule is written. And he's not wrong. This has happened before. Is it fair? Ah, that's up for debate. But they did follow the rule in this situation. Ryan Blaney is a control car. He's just on the outside. Kyle Larson, not the control car on the inside. So, uh, yeah, I get why Blaney's mad, but this is how the rule is written. So then on the next restart, after we finally get through the red flag and the cleanup and everything that went along with that, on the final restart, we have Kyle Larson clears Ryan Blaney um, in the short shoot into turn two. They go through turn two, and as they're going through turn two on the exit, Ryan Priest gets spun out by Chase Elliott. Priest did say that his fuel pressure went from 66 PSI down to 13, so he was out of fuel, and that's why he lifted, essentially, and just Chase didn't have anywhere to go and just turned him. Wasn't malicious, didn't do it on purpose, just the 41 ran out of fuel. As he spins, he blows his tires out. He's stranded on the backstretch right there. He started to roll, then couldn't anymore because, like I said, his tires were flat. By the time that happens, leaders are probably going into turn four. And you can see that the 41's not moving. And everybody's like, all right, well, we're going to get another restart here, going to another overtime. Well, NASCAR holds the caution. They hold the caution. They hold the caution. And Larson's not coming storming down the front stretch. And uh, we're watching this going, are they going to throw the white flag here or are they going to throw a caution flag because I think everybody expected a caution because we've seen this happen a bunch of times before but instead NASCAR displays the white flag Kyle Larson takes it sails off into turn one NASCAR throws the caution for the 41 not moving and that is where a lot of people are upset about it I get it I get why people are upset 100 now this is NASCAR hasn't said this. I don't know if they'll even comment on this. For me, my personal thought process on this is they didn't want a Nashville to play out again. They knew that there was a lot of people questionable on fuel here. They didn't want to see a bunch of crashes happen, a bunch of, you know, random, a possible random winner, if that were to happen. And just the chaos that ensued with five overtimes in Nashville, I don't think they wanted that to happen again on Sunday. Plus, NBC had already moved the race from NBC to USA, so you don't have that primetime audience anymore. And it seemed like they maybe just wanted to end this race. Now, I'm not saying that to happen. Elton Sawyer said that they were giving the 41 every chance that he could to get rolling so that they could have a normal finish. And I get the explanation. It just really seemed like the 41 wasn't going to eventually be moving. So, meh. Maybe there's something to clean up there. Maybe not. Unfortunate, right? People never want to see a race end under caution, but kind of is what it is. At this point, Kyle Larson is your winner. He picks up his first win at Indianapolis, like I said, gets out, does his burnout, gets out after the race and says, hey, I love you, Indiana fans. I know you love me. How about we come back here and kiss these bricks again in May? 
he's going to make another run at the Indy 500, which is massive for him, the track, the 500, everything, because it was a great story this year. It's going to be an even bigger story next year as he's more comfortable in that car. So yeah, overall, this race was probably about a 60. Wasn't the best race we've ever seen. Wasn't the worst race, but it was very on brand for what the Brickyard 400 is. I kind of wish that was passing was a little bit easier. I don't know if putting a bigger spoiler on this, this car is going to, you know, create a bigger hole in the air so the guys can pass. But passing was at a premium on Sunday. Also, post race, I decided on my way out of the racetrack, sitting in the parking lot, listening to Sirius XM NASCAR, which I never do. So I listened to NASCAR radio for the first time in the post-race callers with Brad Gilly, maybe who that was hosting. And I've decided, I think I need to join Sirius XM NASCAR and have a call-in show because the people that call into that show are absolutely riveting. It had me yelling at the radio in the truck. It was infuriating. It was exhilarating. It was frustrating all at the same time. And I've decided I would like to be the host of one of those channels, one of those shows, rather, not channels, but somebody over at SiriusXM NASCAR, give me a call, set me up with a set me up with a call-in show post-race or even during the week. I don't really care because it would be absolutely electric. The Xfinity race on Saturday, while seemingly somewhat manufactured, um, with its super speedway package that they had on the cars was entertaining. It reminded me a lot of an Indy Lights race. Riley Herbs, hats off to him for getting that victory. Um, Anderson, the tire guy, I missed his first name at Chicago when we were talking. My apologies to him. Congrats to everybody over at that 98 team, though. That's a massive win for them. Riley's second career win. Drove the last four laps of that race were the best four laps he's ever driven in his career. Uh, passing Eric Almirola there on the last lap. Just complete opposite lock. Never lifting in turn four, drives off the corner, wins the race. Just really cool. Two passes in the last lap there, like it was the Indianapolis 500. Crazy, crazy stuff. Almirola, Ron Bouchard's him down the front stretch, taking the white flag while the two Haas teammates are battling side by side. And then Riley just gets after it on that last lap, drafts back up to the 20 car, passes him in turn four, wins the race. Huge accomplishment for, for him, especially at a time where, you know, he says he's keeping all of his options open. You know, he's Haas Factory said, oh, we'd love to have him back. But I think everybody kind of knows he's probably headed to 2311 Racing next year. And then, of course, on Friday night, you have the Truck Series race at IRP. Love IRP. Would love to see the, the Xfinity Series there as well. Even though they had a really good race at the big track, I still would love to see them back at the short track on the other side of town. Um Ty Majeski ends up winning the race back to back wins at that track for him. I love IRP. I think that is one of the better racetracks out there. Multiple different lanes, progressive banking, really interesting, um, just different driving styles, different lines that people are going to take. Majeski and Ekes were basically the class of the field pretty much the whole night. Corey Heim drove back through. Ekes and Heim had a bit of a conflict there as well. Uh, their post race confrontation was laughably bad. It's just like. Eck is is very Martin or Matt Kenseth uh, like in his approach and just seems unbothered by most things. Corey Heim, I think, was trying to assert himself as maybe a tough guy and just didn't seem to work out there uh, for that. But overall, really enjoyed that experience. Arca race as well. Um, Connor Zilich, once again, wins another race, turned 18 uh, on Monday as well. So hats off to him. Gotten finally drive a NASCAR Xfinity car. Expect him to be at JRM full time next year as well in the Xfinity series, probably with like WeatherTech as a sponsor, which is on SVG's car this year. So that probably means SVG's moving up to the Cup Series, maybe, possibly, probably. We'll have to wait and see on that one. So the complaint of the week or the dumb move of the week, whatever you want to call it, is the number of people that do not understand why NBC had to preempt pre-race coverage as well as move the basically the end of the race off of NBC and over to USA. So I tried to explain this on TikTok. What happened with the president on Sunday is a monumental historical moment. It has literally never happened in the history of this country where a sitting US president has elected to not seek re-election after going after going through the entire primary process and winning his party's nomination Three weeks out from the convention, that has never happened before. Yes, Lyndon Baines Johnson, LBJ, elected to not seek re-election for what technically seemingly would have felt like his third ter term. He was constitutionally allowed to. Obviously, he replaced JFK. Then he was elected for his first term, which would have been four years. He was allowed to then run again. He decided not to. He did enter the first couple of primaries and then in March elected to no longer 
seek the presidency or the nomination from his party. So what happened with the president this time around has never happened before. It is major US news, major world news, will eventually be in textbooks. It had to be talked about pre-race. That's why the pre-race coverage got moved to USA so that the NBC News could talk about it. And then at the end of the race, NASCAR is running up on against the end of the TV window at six o'clock. NBC knows that they have a bunch of local affiliates on the East Coast that are absolutely chopping at the bit to talk about what happened with the president because they know it's going to be good ratings for them. They know they can get the rage clicks and everything else that goes along with that. They need to move that coverage over to USA because their local affiliates want to talk about what happened in world news on Sunday. I get it. It's frustrating, but that's why it happened. And I know for a lot of NASCAR fans, myself included, I love watching NASCAR, but you have to understand that NASCAR does not rank very high on the importance of news when something like this happens. So Fox would have done the same thing. ABC would have done the same thing. CBS, NBC, they all would have done the same exact thing. So unfortunate, but it's major, major news. Moving on to the two open wheel races on Sunday as well. You had the IndyCar series up in Toronto. Colton Herta finally snaps a two year winless drought. He wins on the streets of Toronto exclusively on Peacock. So maybe 20,000 people saw it. Highly unfortunate uh, there. Augustine Canapino and uh, Scott Dixon seemingly had some contact. Canapino went into the wall. I'm sure that his fans will respond cordially and nicely and not try to wage war against the entire country of New Zealand at this point. Point. And then we had a couple of other incidents, uh, including a massive one where Pato Award spins out into the corner. He's sitting there, and while the lights are flashing, it didn't really seem like there was a local yellow happening there. I know some track marshals were complaining that they were catching a lot of flack for it, and they're like, not our fault. We were we were doing our job. And because of that, Santina Ferrucci comes into the corner, not realizing, I guess, that there's an accident there, ramps off the front of the five-car Pato Award, goes flying into the catch fence, thankfully, bottom of the car first, Flips over, he's on his roof, AMR safety got to him very quickly, but for Santino, realized quickly he is in fact not a bald eagle, as much as he wants to be uh, an American flag bald eagle screaming as he storms down the straightaways at Indianapolis every year for the 500, he is in fact not capable of flying, which is probably a good thing. He was okay after that incident. Scary moment though, when it, when he was flipping, it looked like his head got compressed down a little bit, but I'm uh, obviously he said he's fine, so thankful for, for that happening. Like I said, um, Colton Herta goes on to win the race. His teammate Kyle Kirkwood in second. Scott Dixon, P15 to P3, because of course that's what Scott Dixon does. He's made a deal with the devil that apparently has just turned him into a timeless machine when it comes to performing in the IndyCar series. You also had Penske on Penske violence when Will Power spun out Scott McLaughlin. McLaughlin got out and gave him a sarcastic golf clap there, telling him, hey, good job, bud. Sent me off into the barriers there like an absolute Muppet. Um, not the best showing for those guys whatsoever. Theo Porcher flies. Alexander Rossi breaks a thumb in Friday practice. McLaren calls up Theo. They're like, hey, we need you to get to Toronto if you want to drive an Indy car again. Yes, we know we fired you. Yes, we know you're probably pissed off about it. But hey, we have an open seat. Do you want it? He's in the French Riviera, not to be confused with the Redneck Riviera, much nicer over in France, not that stupid 30A nonsense down in Florida. He gets on a flight from Nice, that's in France, to Frankfurt, spelled just like nice, it's pronounced Nice, flies to Frankfurt, and then he's there. He debriefs with Tony Kanaan before his next flight, looks at all the onboard footage, downloads that so he can watch on the flight, flies from Frankfurt to Toronto, Lands there, meets a team representative and a camera guy from Era McLaren. They hop on the train. They take the train down as close as they can get to the track, hop in a car, and he's there just in time for qualifying to qualify for the Toronto Grand Prix. Didn't even qualify dead last. So, hey, shout out to him. Just an absolute wild travel day in, like, less than 24 hours for, for Theo Porcher. Not even that. Probably, like, 14 hours. Kind of crazy uh, for him. So, Cool to see McLaren and he be able to put their, you know, maybe dispute aside and get him in a car and let him get back out there and race. A lot of crashes. I think there was only 12 cars running at the end of that IndyCar race as well. So maybe it was for the best that it was on Peacock. And then on Sunday morning as well, you had the Formula One Hungarian Grand Prix. McLaren locked out the front row. You're like, all right, maybe they actually do have all the speed. They de definitely have the fastest car. Will they screw it up this time? Well, they didn't screw it up. They got a one-two finish in the race. But boy, did they have to navigate some bad waters to get there. So the team undercuts themselves, essentially. They pit Lando Norris. He stays, or he's out there running around. They still have to pit Oscar Piatra. They pit him. Norris undercuts him. He's gone now by four seconds. 
and driving away from Piastri after they come out of the pits. Piastri, of course, beat Lando into turn one on lap one and then had the lead of the race and seemingly was his race to win. Now McLaren is telling Lando over the final stint of this race, hey, you got to give the race lead back to Oscar. You got to do this. We trust you'll do the right thing. Remember all of our meetings on Sunday mornings. Hey, if you want to win a championship, you're going to need Oscar. You're going to need the team. Do the right thing. And Lando's like, hey, this is not my problem. This is a problem you guys created. If you didn't want to do this, you shouldn't shouldn't not have done it. So he's going around and contemplating, you know, obviously running a bunch of different scenarios in his head. And then ultimately, with three laps to go, he gives up that four and a half second lead, essentially, and lets Oscar Piastri by. Piastri picks up his first Formula One career series win. I like he's Heike Kovalainen. Now we'll get to see, does he only win one race in his career like he was Kovalainen, like he was Esteban Ocon, or does he go on to become a future world champion? Um, I think that's kind of just there's no in between with that one. Jensen Button, um, you know, did the same thing. So, yeah, if I was Lando, I think personally, I think Lando messed up. I think he needed to defy team orders there like he was Sebastian Vettel in Malaysia and absolutely win that race for himself, assert himself as that number one driver in the team, assert his dominance to that team. And now he seemingly is on an equal level with his teammate, much less experienced teammate, Oscar Piastri. And for Lando, I think it's a bad look. I think this is a guy that has, you know, seemingly thought of himself as a future Formula One world champion. You know, England seems to think that he's a future Formula One world champion as well. They've appointed him as next up, essentially, he and George Russell. And you cannot be giving away race wins like this. And essentially, Lando said what I think a lot of people were thinking. Hey, he's like, hey, I'm fighting for a championship. And he is. Now he is 76 points behind Max Verstappen in the Drivers' Championship. He would have been 69. Nice. Behind him. That's less than three races. Now he's more than three races. Obviously, if he gets past the slap, it's less than three. You get what I'm saying here. But for the team, for the constructors, it doesn't matter what order they finish in. It's still max points if Oscar wins or if Lando wins and the other one finishes second. Just a real big, bad you know, cluster that happened on Sunday for, for McLaren. You also had a run-in, another run-in, with Max and Lewis. Max goes down the inside into turn one, just completely outbreaks himself, and Lewis is still just driving straight, gets hit by Max, and I don't know what else he could have done there other than, like, turn dead left and drive off the racetrack to avoid Max, and Max wants a penalty, and it's like, dude... You're the one that caused this. Max was livid on the radio from the start of the race. The team wasn't having it. He wasn't having it. They're yelling at each other. Just a really bad relationship over at Red Bull right now. They no longer have the fastest car. I think they've overdeveloped this car to the point where they don't even know where the baseline is to make this car perform as well as it should. And McLaren has the best car at the moment. Mercedes is very close as well. Lewis finishes set, uh, third. And once again, just like in Malaysia with the Multi-21, Sebastian Vettel, Mark Webber, Lewis is standing there watching this chaos play out. On Sunday, he's standing on the podium again watching this McLaren nonsense play out as well, just being like, ah, at least every time I'm in a team, I know who the number one is at that rate. So just bad overall. So Yo. looking ahead for next week, I'll be honest, it's bleak. IndyCar and NASCAR are off until after the Olympics, so we get two weekends off from them. We have the Formula One Belgian Grand Prix on Sunday morning on ESPN or ESPN2, whatever it is, at 9 a.m. And then we also have the ARCA Series from Salem Speedway Sunday at 8 o'clock, Salem, Indiana. I will be in attendance for my second ARCA race of the year. Excited to get back there. I haven't been to Salem in a couple of years. Uh, so, yeah, if you're going out to that race, hey, stop by and say, hey, like and subscribe to the channel. Let me know what you think about the show, everything that happened. Uh, follow me on TikTok at Breakheart, Instagram and Twitter at Breakheart Blog.